Hi, it's Alex. Today I want to talk about how people approach gardening, and I want to talk about something that I see going on in our society that I don't like, and what I think the solution to it is, how I want to improve this. I see a lot of talk about ecologically sound gardening and native plant gardening, and people are starting to get really excited about this. Um, there's this book that I know a lot of people who've read called Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. A lot of people are reading this book, and it communicates the importance of native plants for promoting biodiversity. So it talks about things like how when you plant a native plant, there are more insects that eat that plant than if you plant a non-native plant. And th that in turn supports birds and spiders and other things in the food web. So you're protecting biodiversity. A lot of people are getting on board with this, and they're like, okay, native plants are good, but they're approaching this with a really simplistic understanding of ecology, often very little understanding of ecology at all. Like, it's, it's become almost like a buzzword. People are like, okay, I'm going to get a native plant, and I'm going to grow native plants in my garden, and if something is native, then it's good. And like, this is being exploited by the nursery industry, the commercial nursery industry. And the nursery industry is doing next to nothing to change their whole supply chain, their whole way of doing business. And the way that nurseries do business, commercial nurseries do business nowadays, for the most part, is really damaging ecologically. And I think that we need a fundamental shift in how we garden, not just saying, I'm going to buy native plants. Like, I want to illustrate some problems with this. If you go to the nursery and you look for a plant, first of all, the whole concept of native, it's not agreed on by consensus what it means for something to be native, and it's not necessarily a legally protected designation. And also, a lot of times, like, I've talked to salespeople, and they'll say, I'm, I'll ask them, is this native? And they're like, oh yeah, this is native. And they'll say that stuff like hostas are native to North America. It's not true. I've heard people say things like lily of the valley, native to North America. There are some plants where there are native and non-native versions of it. Like a good example is the red raspberry. There are native res ra red raspberries in North America. There are ones native to Europe. If you get one at a nursery, it might be one from Europe, it might be a hybrid. A lot of times the staff don't know. And this is another problem. Like, even if you talk to the people who are in the know at the nursery, like in terms of the people who run the business, who order the plants and stuff, they typically are ordering their plants from this business far away. Like, and, and sometimes this stuff is produced the whole way across the country. Like, if you go to local nurseries here in Delaware or Pennsylvania, this region, you will find trees that are grown in Washington State. Like, I've asked people, where do you get your trees from? And they're grown in Washington State. And they have no idea what the source population is for that tree. And this is important. Like, take a sugar maple as an example. A sugar maple is it's an important tree in the forests of eastern North America. And it has a really wide geographic distribution. Uh, it occurs, it's really common, like in Vermont, up in New England, it goes into Ohio, um, it goes the whole way south to Florida. It's very uncommon, but there is a sugar maple native to Florida. And I say a sugar maple, because although it is considered this one continuous species and it can interbreed, if you take a sugar maple from Florida and you plant it in Vermont, or vice versa, it's probably not going to grow very well it might not grow at all, it might die, because that's a completely different climate, Florida and Vermont. I think this illustrates the problem. Plants that have wide distribution have genetic diversity, and they have localized adaptions. They have adaptations to grow in different climates, in different soil types, things like that. When you go to a nursery, you're getting mass-produced plants that, for the most part, are standardized. In many cases, they're standardized across the entire country, or they might be standardized across a broad geographic region. You are not helping to preserve that local biodiversity. So like, you buy a sugar maple to plant in your yard, who knows where it's from? It might be a named cultivar, it might be like a cloned plant. Cloned plants introduce another problem. I've seen this happen. Uh, there will be a certain cultivar of tree that is planted along a street, 
and every tree will be genetically identical because they're cloned. And it's like, that's great if you want to have predictable characteristics of the tree, like which people tend to like for gardening, but then when a pest comes, uh, some sort of like beetle or caterpillar or whatever, like plants in nature, each one is unique, they each have a different blend of chemicals they produce to protect against things. So like in nature, if a pest hits one tree, it'll typically you know, hit that tree, but it won't be able to move as easily to the other ones, because they're producing a different blend of chemicals. But like what will happen with these is there'll be a disease or infestation and it'll spread, and sometimes it'll kill all the trees. And it's like, the trees are not evolving if they're cloned like that. I want to give another example. Uh, I see a lot of people who plant things that are native, but they're native to North America. So for example, uh, where I live, people plant a lot of purple coneflower. It's a pretty plant, and people say it's native. Now, where is it native to? It's really common in Missouri, Arkansas, Illinois. There are only a few counties that have small isolated populations of this plant on the east coast. So like, in Pennsylvania, I think the USDA only shows one county where this occurs in a wild population. So it's kind of native, like it's native to North America, but it's not really a locally native plant. It's very different from like Rudbeckia herda, a species of black-eyed Susan that is abundant, and you can find it in the wild, in the surroundings, in like Delaware, Pennsylvania, a lot of other areas. I really think it's important to plant locally native stuff, and I've noticed like when I grow the locally native Rudbeckia herda, black-eyed Susan, in my garden, and I grow it next to the purple coneflower that you get from a nursery that is native to North America but not locally native here, I notice that there are a lot more insects supported by the, the plant that is locally native. And I've noticed this pattern play out over and over again. So it's like, okay, purple coneflower, probably not going to become a damaging invasive plant like garlic mustard, but it's not going to have the same ecological benefit as a truly locally native plant. I think this stuff is really important. Humans are destroying the environment at unprecedented rates. Like, we are causing extinction of many, many species, and one of the big things we're doing is habitat loss. We're just building on all the available land. We're building suburbs, cities, we're building industrial things, and we're building agriculture. We're using agriculture, and people are like, oh, protect farms and stuff, but like, farms are taking up space that would have been a wild ecosystem. I think it's critically important, if we're going to protect as much biodiversity as possible, for us to create as much wild or semi-wild space as we can. And we can do that in our gardens, but we need to like understand the deep stuff. Like plants are not these objects that you install in your landscape as if it were like a building toy or something. It's not like you build a house. Plants are living beings, they have populations, they have genetic diversity, just like you and I do. Um, you can see that genetic diversity. You can, like, if you grow a lot of plants, you'll see the flower shape is subtly different, the leaf shape is subtly different, and there's value in that biodiversity. And that biodiversity corresponds to, like, insect biodiversity and animal biodiversity. And it's like, do you care about all these things? I care about all these things. I want to protect as much biodiversity as possible. If you are a gardener and you want to do these things, I think it's super important to, like, not just say native plants, but to do research and say what's locally native in this area. I say forget commercial nurseries. Like, they have not caught up. If they catch up, then I will start recommending them. I have never found a large commercial nursery that is anywhere at the level that they would need to be for me to recommend buying plants there. Like, you want to get plants from local populations, grow them from seed, get stuff that comes up in your yard, learn what's what, learn to identify it. This is how we're going to protect and preserve biodiversity. It's like, this is the next level. I want to go far beyond what Doug Tallamy is advocating in this bringing nature home thing. Like, he's like, oh, it's okay to plant cultivars and stuff. I'm like, why would you want to plant a cultivar? Wouldn't you want genetically 
unique plants, that's what I want. I want us to be preserving the populations of these plants that occur in our local areas. Like, I want to grow plants in my yard that are grown from seed from populations within ideally a one to two mile radius, and max like fifty mile radius or so. I don't want them to be coming from other states or across geographic divides, things like that. So, this is what I have to say for now. I'd love to go into this more in the future, because I think this is a really deep topic, I think there's a lot to be said about it. But yeah, thanks for your time. Bye bye!